markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Ladies and gents, this is Chat with Traders, episode 213. Today, I speak with John Robison. And if you ever speak with John yourself, well, maybe he will tell you he's simply a hick from Texas. However, I will tell you he's a well-experienced equities trader who's been able to harness the power of technology and leverage the skills of his team to maximize his trading operation. John started out in 2007 and has been involved in various groups since. Today, though, he is with Kirshner Trading Group in Austin, Texas. Although John originated as a discretionary click trader, over the years, he began to automate more and more to the point that he now runs a portfolio of 80 plus automated models that do everything from news and earnings to mean reversion and momentum to arbitrage and microstructure. In our chat, John tells of his early days, which are particularly interesting because it was one tiny edge he stumbled across almost a year in that enabled him to start making money consistently and it afforded him more time to discover other trades or other edges. But the main part of our chat is centered around automated trading and lessons from his years of practice. Make sure you stay tuned for the part where John tells a frightening pull the plug story of when a stop loss order malfunctioned while trading Chevron stock. I have no idea exactly how much this cost him, but within seven seconds, his account had been drained to just $6,000. I'll post a visualization of the trades from Nanex in the show notes. It's wild. Uh, The talk of automated trading leads into machine learning and John's use of such techniques. Please note, at one point, I asked John what resources he found helpful for learning and understanding machine learning. He read several books on the subject, but couldn't think of the titles while we were talking. He's since sent me the links to all of these, and they can be found in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com slash 213. To take us out, John talks on obsessing over your edge and why he adheres to the concept of thinking really, really small. And that's it, my friends. Here is John Robertson for episode 213. A very simple question to get things rolling. How did you get into trading? Completely by accident, just absolutely completely by accident. And uh, in college, I studied philosophy, and I wanted to be a philosophy professor. So I was I was going to do my PhD. I was super excited. I had the guy, uh, inexplicably, the guy that I wanted to to study under said yes, and and that was great. But I got married. And so I got married and, you know, that's, that's great. It didn't change my plans, but I said, well, look, um, uh, somebody with a philosophy PhD is never going to make any money and we have a small amount of debt. So why don't we work for one year? We'll work for one year. We'll pay off our debt and then we'll be, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue in school. So we said, okay, that's great. Um, my wife is a, she was a school teacher. Um, and so that was great. That was more than enough to pay our bills. And then the goal was I would find some job um, and hopefully make enough money to pay off all the debt. Well, so as it turns out, nobody wants to hire a philosophy major. So I couldn't get a job anywhere. I mean, I even did, I did a bunch of stuff in the philosophy of math and somehow I couldn't even convince some random private school to, to hire me teaching a little bit of math. Um, and so there was this, so there, there was this trading shop that one of my roommates in college was trading at and he said, Hey, come over here. I said, okay, well, there's nothing else that I can do. So I'll go over there. And that was how I got started trading just completely by accident. (laughs) Now this trading shop he was at, that was a prop firm. I take it. Yeah. So there was, well, the, the details of it are a little weird and complicated because the regulatory treatment was changing at the time, but it was regular, it was retail and then prop. Um, so I was, I was sort of, 
yeah, I, I was retail for the first few months and then I became prop after a few months. There was all the regs were changing in the market and that kind of stuff. Okay. So from the sounds of things, it was your your goal in this year, which you were taking off from school to earn some money to pay off your debts. How did you go during that first year? Did you earn enough money to pay off your debts? Well, that's complicated. <laughs> so sort of. Um, so so I started in July of 2007. And, uh, and from July 2007 through March 2008, um, I tried everything, man. I mean, I just, I talked to everyone who would talk to me and, and I, I listened to them. I had this, I had this sense that I wasn't going to steal anyone's trade. So, so a couple of people told me some strategies that actually would have worked. And I mean, looking back on it, I was being stupid. They were, they were, they were inviting me to, to try out some of their kind of lower tier strategies, help me get my start, but I, I was too stubborn. And so I, I just, I just did anything for about nine months. Um, and then in March, by, by the end of March, I started with 5,000 bucks and I was down to $800 actually. So I was down from 5,000 to $800. And I mean, I was, I, I was pretty stressed. It was like this, this year's going to be a failure. Um, I won't have made any money. I won't have anything. And so I went back home. Um, and, uh, and it was a long weekend. I think it was Easter weekend maybe. And so, so it was a long weekend and I had these really, really, really extensive journals. Um, these journals that I had kept, uh, for that, whatever it is, eight months. And I looked through the journals and I tried to figure out, look, out of all of these different things that I've tried, did anything actually work? And I was guided, uh, by this, this idea I'd read in the, in the market wizards book. Uh, the first one, I think he says, uh, I think he's Jim Rogers. He says, my trading style is basically, I stand in the middle of a room and I look around till I see a pile of money sitting in a corner. Then I walk over and I get the pile of money and that's it. And so I said, look, somewhere in this journal, there has to be a little pile of money for me to walk over, pick up and come back. And so sure enough, I, I did find something. There was just this one tiny trade that I found, but it worked incredibly consistently. Um, I, I, I can tell you more about it um, in a bit, but I, I don't want to distract from the narrative. And so that I went from trading all these different things and trying all these different things to I just had one strategy that I could do most days, basically one time. I basically had enough capital um, to be able to kind of go all in once on a pretty small arbitrage. And so sure enough, I mean, somehow as luck would have it, uh, that very next month in April, so I had 800 bucks in my account and in April I made 1100 bucks. And that month I only had one down day as I recall, and I lost $6. So I was like, wow, you know, maybe this, maybe this market wizard guy really knows what he's talking about. Um, I should try it again. So sure enough, then in May, the next month made a thousand bucks again. All right. So I figured, well, might as well double my size. So I got more aggressive. I doubled my size, and then in June, I made two thousand dollars. Then four, then eight, then sixteen, then thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight. Technically, after twelve months, I think I had just broken even. But within a few months after that, I think I had made like three hundred fifty grand, something like that, by the by the end of two thousand eight. So I'd gone from you know, 800 bucks to 350 grand. I, I, I wish that I had a strategy that was that good again so that I could make <laughs> um, those kind of returns again. If I do, Aaron, I'll, I'll share it with you. And so you, you and I can both trade it. <laughs> I'd appreciate but, uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, I guess uh, it's going to be no surprise what my next question is. You know, can you talk about what that strategy was? Yeah, sure. So, so it, it doesn't work now. And in fact, it didn't work after just a couple of months. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, so I'll try to hit the high notes. So in 2007, 2008, there were some meaningful structural changes taking place in the market. Um, I couldn't remotely have articulated it to you like this at the time. I, I, 
I, I just sort of knew what worked and I found, I find that that's kind of how my trades always work. I just sort of find what works and then I can articulate five or 10 years later why it worked, but it, I just saw that it worked. And so what happened, there was Reagan MS that was passed in 2007. And so you have the hybrid market, this kind of stuff. And so it went from like before that, uh, let's say you were just trading like some of the bigger stocks, like the big ETFs. Um, there weren't very many ETFs at that time, but so maybe you trade, you know, you, you trade the big ones. And at that time, as I recall, they all traded on NICE, okay, which is weird. Um, none of them trade on NICE anymore, but so, I mean, they were just a handful and so they were on NICE. And so what would happen was in, you could just, you could just put these bids out like meaningfully in the money. Um, so, you know, it's trading FXI is trading at 200 bucks a share. Uh, this is before all the splits and stuff. So FXI is trading at 200 bucks a share. Um, the bids like, you know, 200 by 250 cents. And then you got your bids starting 50 cents outside of that, you know, and you put them on NICE and then they would get swept. Occasionally some guy comes in seeking liquidity and he just hits market on NICE. And so you're, you know, you get the free money that's 15, 30, 80 cents in the money. And then you immediately, uh, get out on ECNs. Okay. So you used to be able to do that. And then they put in Reagan MS and that kind of disappeared relatively quickly. But then what they did was they go from that to, uh, they started converting everything in the middle of the fricking, um, financial crisis. They started converting all the ETFs to ARCA, which was really small at the time. And they started adding a bunch of ETFs. So the, there are all these new ETFs to trade. Um, there's a lot of volatility, a lot of action. Everybody is way too busy doing so much other trading, um, trying to make sure that, you know, Lehman Brothers is the end of it and not whatever your favorite investment bank is. Everybody's so busy doing that that they hadn't really figured out the technical rules of ARCA yet. And so on ARCA, they had all these, they all, they had all these special rules for the closing auction, um, the way that they did the closing auction. And so what I, what I figured out, so it was, it was, it was also really weird to get the feeds for it. Um, so the, the feeds would be like, uh, as I recall, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it on any trading software. So I had to go to the actual ARCA website and hit refresh like a million times. I had to hit refresh on the ARCA website just over and over and over and over and over um, in order to see any of the data. And so in the final minute at that time, the ARCA closing auction would just, it would just say like FXI is trading at 200 bucks and it's going to close at 203. Uh, and sure enough, it would do it. Um, exactly as it said that it was going to do. And I think it was because there weren't any other ARBs in at the time. Right. Um, and so, so I, I was doing that. And then by the end of the nine months, my margins had started dropping a lot on that trade. And then a year after that first April, I mean, the, the trade was, it, it was, it was morphed at best, but the alpha had decayed just massively. So what was that like for you? Because this is like the one trade which made you profitable. You know, where did that leave you now? What was the next step from there? Man, yeah, good, <laughs> good, good question. You obviously think like a trader. Um, <laughs> so then, so then 2009, 2009 was a little weird for me. Uh, it, it worked out great though. I'm, I'm grateful that I did it and all that. So I, so the first several months of 2009 went very well. Um, I knew so little about the markets and that kind of thing. Gosh, I just, I, I look back and I think about in March of 2009, why didn't we just buy all that there was of Las Vegas Sands and like Invesco and PIMCO, the, the closed in funds that were on the market and some of the bank preferreds. So I didn't do that, but I, I did, I'd figured out a couple of new trades. And, uh, so I, so I was up to like four or five total trades that worked. Uh, at that point, but I was still pretty reliant on the, on the first trade. And so I think I was up like 150 or 200 grand a few months in to the, to the year. And then, 
there was this there was this kind of event in early in early June. It wasn't horrible, but it was the first time that I put in a really big all in bet. And it was this it was this momentum trade that was based on some stuff that was happening with the banks. Um, and they were just the banks were going wild. And I, being an idiot, bought only one bank. I only bought JP Morgan. Just as I was about to exit, and I was going to have my biggest day ever, I think. Uh, it's going to be my first six-figure six day. And, uh, and I, was, I was really excited. I was just having so much fun. Um, and then JP Morgan somehow leaked its stress tests. Uh, so JP Morgan leaks its stress tests. I think I went from like up 120 or 140 to like down 20 or something like that. So it was, it was, it was a huge loss for me of kind of confidence and, and a lot of other things, but it was like, John, you gotta, you gotta work on really building out your strategy portfolio. Um, so, so I started doing that for the back half of that year. And so for the back half of that year, uh, I made some money actual trading, but what I really focused on was I had found a couple of trades that would work, but it was like, you could do 40 or 50 different stocks at a time in these trades. And so I figured out that some people that I knew were really, really fast on the keys and they were great with decision making and stuff like that. And I, I wasn't that good at that. Um, but I knew that computers were a lot faster than I was. So I got this guy, I don't even remember how I found him, but he was a software developer and he knew just enough about how trading worked uh, that, he could, that he could write me some stuff. And so I wrote my first automated stuff that year. Um, so it was, it was basically these sort of sophisticated stop loss orders. Uh, there, there, were this, there were these kind of very specific um, set of things that all had to kind of align for me to want to, to be in a position. And then the moment that they backed out, boom, I just wanted to get out immediately, right? Um, and if I did that right, I was basically risking – eight or 12 cents to make like 40 to 80 cents. So it worked out really, really well. But if I missed it, like if, if I missed my out, sometimes it could just turn against me so fast. And so, so I got this guy to write some stuff for me and predictably he wrote exactly what I told him to do because he was good at his job and I was not good at my job. And so what I told him to do lost me a whole bunch of money. Because there were all these little exception cases and things like that that I hadn't thought of. I mean, it was I, I had two of my biggest losers ever uh, right after he put that, uh, right, right after we rolled out the first one. It was because I kept trusting it was going to work the way that I wanted it to in my mind, but it, it, it didn't. Um, and so I went, so for a few months, for, for a few months, I'm sort of working on that. I'm fixing that out. And then after a few months, it does work, right? So now I've got it to where, and so the, the year after that, I made, I had a new best year ever. And then the year after that, I had a new best year, best year ever. And the year after that, I had a new best year ever. And so at every, at every point, I'm kind of adding new strategies, new ideas. Um, by the end of it, I had gone from uh, these automated exits to then I added automated entries. And then I said, well, let's just put them all together. You know, let's make this, uh, let's make fully automated stuff. And so that's kind of, that, that's kind of the next few years. Okay. Yeah. This is really interesting. I mean, this is one of the things which uh, got me excited to speak with you is because, you know, your origins, you started out as what you could call a discretionary click trader, um, but you've sort of evolved into very much an automated trader, um, still trading uh, intraday, et cetera. This trade which you found where there was kind of 40 to 50 stocks you could be trading at uh, various times throughout the day, what was that trade? Is this the trade I'm just trying to put two and two together here because you sent me through a, a few things um, prior. Um, is this the trade which uh, you would see kind of price bouncing from large orders in the depth? Yeah, yeah. So there was – so one of the bigger parts of it was that uh, at that time, and they, they don't do it nearly like they did 
I mean, it's not even, it, it's nothing similar. So at, at that time, really often in the order book, there would be at whole numbers. So at, you know, 150 bucks or 25 bucks or whatever, there would be these just massive, massive orders for no reason. Um, I don't know. It was some mutual fund was taking profit or I, I have no idea. But so you'd see randomly 400,000 shares there. And so you could try to get in front of it. And then if it works or if, if it doesn't work, then you, you kind of get out um, as, that, as that order is, is uh, getting eaten up, right? So at, at that time, they would go slowly enough. There weren't all the HFTs and things like now. Um, so you could actually do it by hand uh, if you were good enough. Now those those big orders get they, they get played on by HFTs a whole bunch now, and there there are some interesting trades you can do with the order book now. I mean, obviously HFTs make a lot of money on order books, but yeah, so you would you would find there were kind of some some specific elements to a setup that would make one really really good, and then you could use these giant offers or sometimes bids as your backstop. Okay, that makes sense. And so the automated exits which you built into the strategy, so you would get in uh, manually yourself, and then you had mm-hmm. these automated exits to with the sophisticated stop loss orders to to get you out if um, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. So I so I would get in every morning super early, and I would I would scroll through literally every stock in the market that traded any meaningful amount of volume. And I'm just looking for, I'm looking for my setup in, you know, 3000 stocks every morning. It took forever, man. (laughs) And then in whichever ones that I found any potential setups, I would just put a bunch of orders out and then get my automated stop set up and then hope and pray that they work that day. You know, as someone who started out as a hand trader or click trader, whatever you want to call it, you know, was it always the goal for you to um, to automate your trading, or was it just sort of something which uh, came about as a almost a need, uh, almost as like a necessity? Yeah, it, it it just emerged out of evolve or die, you know. And I I wasn't my judgment wasn't as good as other guys. My uh, my speed on the keys was slow. My uh, all of that kind of stuff, but I, I understood, uh, the power of technology and I, I was able to do that at least. Okay. So what would you say was the most difficult part in the beginning once you did start to automate some things? So it sounds like the first step towards automation for you was automating your exits, which was mostly your, your stop loss exits, uh, in that scenario you gave just before. Um, you know, once you kind of moved on from that and started to do, uh, build this out a bit further and automate more things, what proved to be rather difficult? I mean, you already sort of gave that example where um, you'd given a bunch of instructions to the developer and he had done exactly what you asked for, but there were things which you hadn't thought of. I mean, was there anything like that which, you know, <laughs> went on to, to cost you money? Yeah, so very very frequently stuff like that would happen. There was one oh gosh. Yeah, I guess it's it, it's sufficiently related. I was the, the silly way of putting it is that I I am a conspiracy theory on zero hedge. What was it? It was September 2013. In September 2013, so I had this this was actually a generic stop loss. This wasn't even a this wasn't even a particularly interesting stop loss. And so this stop loss got triggered. Um, I was in Chevron. I don't know. I wasn't even in that much. I was like, mm, I think I was in like 25,000 shares or something. So I'm in like 25,000 shares of Chevron in, uh, in September, 2013. And this, this stop loss gets hit. And so I had always been obsessed with risk. That's, that's probably the one thing that I'm really good at in trading as I, I, I can take a loser, like I've got a real strong chin and, uh, and I'm really good about being obsessed with like, what's your edge, what's your risk reward? Um, what, what are your potentials to have a, a big tail loser? Um, how do you mitigate it? That kind of thing. 
And so I talked to the folks who were in the software about what the risk limits were. And I'd set my risk limits really, really low. I mean, it was like, I want to say it was single digits percent of my account or something like that. And it was like, whenever I lost that much, it was just supposed to completely shut off. And I wasn't supposed to be able to trade um, unless I sort of called them up and said, let me trade. So um, my stop loss gets hit and the stop loss started acting wrong. It started acting wrong for sort of some complicated reasons, but the, but the basic, but the basic net effect of it was that, uh, I think I was short. And so what it would do was it would cover the short. Okay. But then it would market by the same amount again. Okay. So I'm short 25,000 shares. And now not only did I cover that 25,000, but now I'm long. Okay. Then it decided, oh, well, I'm in a new position, so I got to get out of that. So it sells the 25,000 shares and then short sells them again. So now I'm short 25,000 shares. So it does this recursively as fast as a computer could do it for 7.3 seconds, during which time it lost a pretty significant amount of money. Um, I mean, it basically zeroed out my account. I think I had six grand left in my account or something like that. And it was, I'm very grateful The the guy sitting next to me, I'm like, I'm like looking at my screen and my screen is just doing weird things. And the guy next to me is just like, he's like, pull the plug. Uh, and so we, uh, so I, I managed, I, I managed to stop it only because my friend sitting next to me is just has the, what's the word, the, the composure, uh, to tell me pull the plug, you know? And so, so I did that. So that was, that, that was a big loss. I'd had a bunch of those. Um, and the, and the basic lesson that I figured out was if you're a trader, what you really want is you want to control every single thing that can possibly affect your PL negatively. Right. So like, I don't mind if somebody else, if let's say I have some interface, right? Like I have a backtesting interface. If somebody else writes all of the code to print the chart on the backtesting interface, then I'm, he can write that and I'll just barely test it and whatever, because that doesn't actually directly affect my PL. Um, but if it is a risk limit that should have been triggered, right, the moment that I hit whatever percent of my, uh, of my account, the moment I had lost that, it should have stopped, but it did not. It didn't, it didn't work right, right? <laughs> so I figured out all of that has to be 100% under my control. I can't trust anyone else to write that. And so I think, I think that became the most important part. And so from there, I started figuring out how can I write everything for myself? How can I write my own system the whole way down? Uh, anything I can't write for myself, like, you know, you can't create your own data feeds. Um, you have to buy them from someone, anything like that. How can I put in all these tests, all these redundancies to make sure that they're not messed up to make sure that if there ever is an error, we're, you know, we might lose some money, but we're not going to lose our account and we're certainly not going to lose the firm. Okay. So just for some clarification here, this stop loss, which went rogue and was buying and selling just as fast as it could. What was that stop loss? That wasn't something that you had, you had built that was a, like an, an order through your trading system or your, your platform or yeah, yeah. So part of it I had had built for me, and then part of it was just sort of built into the platform, and I was just kind of stuck with that, right? And so the thing that I had built had mistakes in it. Uh, however, I thought, you know, foolishly, <laughs> I, I thought I thought that when when we finally hit that mistake, I have so many other things in place um, that it'll be okay. And so it, so it had a mistake and then there were mistakes, there were mistakes at like 19 different levels. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they, they, they all kind of, it, it was sort of like, I think I've counted it out and yeah, it, it was in the teens, the number of things that all had to go wrong simultaneously. Um, if any one of them had not failed, then, uh, then at some point the, the risk would have been stopped and I would have just lost, you know. 20 grand or 70 grand or whatever. Okay. So you just had to ultimately pull the plug and that stopped it at least. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The guy sitting next to me, he's, he's great. I love that guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, thankfully he was there. <laughs> Otherwise, who knows what might've happened. I mean, where do we go from here? I guess one of the things I'm really curious about is, well, maybe this might be a good question to ask you is, is what was the first strategy which you built which was fully automated. So from entries to exits, you know, all the components mm-hmm. of the strategy. Yeah. What was that strategy, which you first built out, which was a fully automated strategy and also how long did that take? Yeah. So that's a, so that's, that is a, it's a good question. However, it's not one I can answer. And the reason is, I mean, the first dozen or so that I made were all failures. Um, so I thought that they were going to work and then they did, they they were just sort of all failures and I don't have, so, I mean, I was running actually dozens simultaneously by the time I ever actually had any that ran reliably. Um, so, so I couldn't, I couldn't kind of go back chronologically and pinpoint which one sort of started working first. It was definitely the the curve definitely worked such that I was making more money with this kind of gray box trading um, where I would either enter or exit using a script uh, for a very, very, very long time. And I was taking all of those profits and using those to build the automated system because I was just so confident that it could, that it could do so much if it ever started working. So this might be a better question to ask you is, with the experience you have now, you've been doing this for many years, uh, the the automate, automated side of things. Why do you think some of those earlier strategies turned out to be failures? Okay, so trading or any kind of strategic behavior really is, it's a, it's a complex system, right? And you have to get, and all of the things multiply together. So it's like, you know, instead of it being, if you have 10 different parts that all have to work together, it's not like two plus two plus two plus two plus two. It's like two times two times two times two times two. And so if, if any of the elements was doing badly, uh, then it it, it could cripple the whole thing. Um, or if any of the elements I hadn't built out. So what I really had to do was I had to just kind of fail at every different spot that I could fix that, keep shoring it up, keeping it, keep improving it. And then finally sort of all of the pieces came together, um, and worked together. Yeah. I still can't, I still can't think of what would have been kind of the first one that, that really worked, but I know, so, so I, I know that at some point I, I started, I started rolling out a lot and the thing that I really needed, um, and this is something I'm really bad at. What I needed was I needed to build a toolkit. Okay. Um, I, I, I was, I was fortunate. I kind of stumbled into somebody else's, uh, sort of primitive toolkit. And now at this point we built out, I think it's a pretty cool toolkit, but so I needed, I needed a suite of more sophisticated backtesting stuff. So with, with the backtesting stuff, I could do a bunch of back tests. Um, I could look at them and say, Oh, what actually, what are actually the good signals for a winner? What are actually these weird tail risk cases that my code does not get me out of. What are those kind of things, right? So the backtesting system, I could do that. I need a good uh, backtesting visualization. The other thing that I use a lot now is, uh, well, and and then I needed sort of scoring systems. So I, I needed to figure out, oh, okay, it turns out that most trades don't just rely on, uh, is this one value high or not, right? It relies on, well, do all of these things sort of come together at, at, at the right time? Um, and then if so, how do you get out when you have a loser? How do you get out when you have a winner? How do you add in those sorts of things? So I've added in, I've got a bunch of backtesting stuff and that is so helpful. The, the big next step I took, and this was really, really helpful. This, this was just huge was machine learning. So all of the stuff that I had written, that, that was the problem of it was that I had these really complicated uh, contingency plans in my mind that was like, well, you need this and this and this together. And then if this ever happens, here's how you deal with that. If this happens, here's how you deal with that. 
And so if I would have actually written down all of those different pieces, I mean, it would have taken me more than a year of my own time just to get one out, just to get the first out. And so, so I, I couldn't really do that. I needed, uh, uh, something of a, of a programming language that would be simpler for me to be able to write in. Um, and I needed, I needed to be able to con to get to really rich decision-making, uh, without having to write it all out kind of in really specific detail. And so what we did, I've got, um, we had, we've, we've built up this toolkit over the years, but, uh, we put in a bunch of machine learning and the way that it'll work is, uh, I tell it all the things that I know will be significant for the trade, right? It's like this and this and this, they'll be significant. And then the way that they interact with each other, that's going to be significant. Um, and then all of this other stuff. And then we run giant back tests, we get giant data sets, and then we put those data sets through a bunch of different machine learning algorithms. Um, and they have all this cool stuff where they do these, we, we, hired, um, we hired some folks from the, the local university, they were PhD candidates. Um, PhD candidates will work for much cheaper <laughs> um, than, than PhDs, professors, that kind of thing. And they also love the fact that I have these, these data sets. Uh, that no one else has access to, right? I have real financial data sets, um, and that's very, very hard for them to get access to. So they got access to my financial data sets, and they got some money, um, and then they built out all this cool math stuff. It's like I, I, I would know, I would know the trader's perspective of here's what I want the machine learning to do. Here's how we can direct it. Here are ways that it's probably going to go wrong. Um, it's going to be lo looking for sort of straight up normal distributions here and the distributions are not going to be anything like normal they're going to be wacky financial distributions and so they built they built all this cool stuff so it'll it'll go it'll examine the data then it'll figure out how predictive is each kind of different element of this data it will build us a bunch of scores uh that scoring system will work uh on a lot of different algorithms and the different algorithms will also have uh, different kind of settings and hyperparameters inside of them. So then we'll have we'll have a bunch of scores, uh, and then it it builds out this thing where you functionally get out of sample results, uh, which I think is super important. I've seen way too many people with these back tests that look perfect. You know, oh my sharp ratio is ten or whatever, but it, it's just not going to work because it's it's not truly out of sample. And so we do all that, and then we say, oh, okay, well, what actually makes for a good score in this? And then we do the good scores, and, uh, and then we plug that into the, uh, into the strategy logic, and then it's going to use that to make its decisions when to get in, when to get out, when to add, that kind of thing. I don't know if any, any of that made sense. It was kind of complicated. <laughs> no, it does make sense. And um, this machine learning part is quite interesting also. So I have naturally a few questions around that. Um, this might not be the right terminology. I'm kind of blanking on what exactly you'd call it, but are there, um, which machine learning algos have been, or are you most using? So there's like, uh, you know, a random forest is one. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we've looked through a whole bunch and we've tried a whole bunch and, what I've figured out is that based on my actual stuff, okay, so this is not, uh, other people probably have, they have data and stuff that works differently. Like I know that, so I know that Google can use a neural net to do image recognition. Okay. I can't use a neural net. I think that my data sets are just not nearly big enough, but the things, the, the things that have worked for me, are number one, the absolute most basic, simple thing that there is, which is called ordinary least squares, OLS. It is just, it is Excalibur. I had a, um, and then the other is uh, versions of modified XGBoost. So XGBoost is, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's the most hailed uh, machine learning algo. And then OLS is kind of, 
it's it, it's amazing. And anybody anybody who's in school will think, well, an undergrad at least, um, they're like, oh, OLS is boring. It's okay, boomer kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but then you you actually use the thing, and it's just wow. And and only if you use it right. Okay, it I I, I couldn't get it to do anything. Okay, I couldn't get it to do anything at all that was any good. And then um, these guys from the university came over and they had all this really cool math stuff to do. A small amount of that was my ideas. Most of it was like, these are the best practices in the industry. This is the way you should do it. Um, and then I said, oh, we should modify it in this tiny way. And then a couple of them, they came, they came up with themselves. So they were just, they just did such a good job. And, uh, and yeah, so once, once you actually use it right, and I have yet to find somebody who can do the other stuff uh, that really, really, really beats it. Um, so I use, I use some clustering stuff. Uh, so K-means is the best known. And what that means is more or less... So imagine you said that there are mean reversion traders and momentum traders. Now, if you have, if you have one group of mean reversion traders and one group of momentum traders, a lot of their behavior, you should just split them out. And you should say, oh, okay, well, whatever a mean reversion trader does, it's probably like they make money on most of their trades and then occasionally they take big losses, for instance. Uh, momentum traders, right, they, they tend to be the other way. Um, they tend to have some giant winners and then a lot of losers. And so if, you're, if your algorithm were just trying to look at all traders together, it would say, oh, okay, well, there's not really a pattern as to whether you have big losers, big winners, frequent winners, frequent losers, whatever it is. But then the moment you know, well, it's really in two clusters, it's momentum and mean reversion. The moment that you know that and you split them up, you say, oh, okay, people in this mean reversion cluster, their stuff follows this way, and the, the momentum folks follow this. So the, the K-means has been effective, OLS is the best, and then XG Boost has been really great for us because it gets – we will use it for kind of a second opinion kind of thing. Um, so the OLS may say like, oh yeah, this thing is, it's a 72 out of a hundred. So, you know, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not great. Or it's a 90, 99 out of a hundred. It's awesome. You know? Um, and, but then occasionally uh, we train several XG boosts in, in different ways but so occasionally one of them, one of the XG boosts will come in and say, yeah, it is really awesome. But if you look at this kind of thing, it's also a lot riskier than you think. There's like a 35% chance that you're going to suffer a gigantic loss. And so, yeah, absolutely take the thing, but size your position smaller than you would normally think to, um, because you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to take this gigantic loser that's just going to mess up your psychology. Once you take these strategies, which have been optimized with the use of machine learning, when they're actually trading, do you completely understand why they are making the decisions they are making? So, no, I, I definitely do not completely understand. However, to me, it's very important that I have a pretty good grasp of it. So, I'll, I'll go into the algorithms. Or the algorithm, the algorithms that really get to make a lot of decisions. There, there are some that can say no, but they can't say yes. If you know what I mean, like there, there are some that are just purely risk mitigation, and they're so complicated. I don't understand them in the end. Um, but with those, that doesn't affect. That can't create tail losers. So when when I say like control your PNL totally. Um, it's okay with me if it's like I lost some opportunity because I didn't I didn't fully understand that. But all the ones that can just say yes, and that's the end of the story, I've looked through every feature. I've looked through, through the distributions of everything. Um, I've looked through the history of it, all of that. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't run the calculation myself, but I'm absolutely confident that, yeah, this, this makes sense. Okay. So when you started out trading way back in 2007, I think you started to get into the automated side of it around about 2011, you know, and now you've, you've implemented 
uh, machine learning techniques and all that sort of thing. What's been some of the the most helpful resources to kind of get uh, familiarize yourself with machine learning? Because obviously it's a pretty steep learning curve uh, to begin with, I'd imagine. Like how did you learn about it? How did you get familiar with it and comfortable to start putting it into use with your own trading? So a friend of mine is, gosh, he's really smart. So he, he recommended a couple of little books to me and <laughs> well, they were, they were little to him. He, he was so experienced and so good at everything, uh, that I, that I looked at those and I was like, wow, this thing is 1100 pages and it expects that, you know, all kinds of industry jargon and this kind of stuff. And so instead I went to the Amazon recommendations based on this book. Okay. And so I went to those and I looked through those and then I went sort of three deep on it. So we had the book that he recommended to me. And then there was, uh, the book that Amazon recommended based on his recommendation. And then another recommendation based on that recommendation. And that one was some kind of like machine learning for dummies. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and I read that thing and I read it in like 20 minutes. It was like a hundred something pages and I just blazed through it so fast. Um, I just, I, I loved it. It was, it was like, I, I read it and I was like, yes, this finally makes sense. And so I, I read that one. Um, and then there was another one that was called, uh, that I moved to after that. It was called data mining. I don't know, top, top 10 algorithms for data mining, I think it was called. Um, it was a little, it was a little hardback book and that was, they didn't mean data mining in the CFA way. It's a, uh, that was a, a term that they gave to some versions of machine learning. I don't know if they still do, but, um, or at least some stuff that's related to machine learning. I don't know all the details, but so, so that book, it, it had 10 algorithms in it and that includes all of the algorithms that I use now existed in some form in that book. Um, I haven't been able to use most of the algorithms in that book, but all of the ones that I use were in that book in some form. Um, and so I read that and based on the first book, I had enough of the vocabulary that I was able to read this book and say, oh, okay, yeah, we could, we could kind of figure this out. So I figured those out and then absolutely the, the most important thing was just hiring people who actually know their stuff. Right. So I, I would, I, I would hire whoever it was. I mean, I think at this point I've got 17 different people who are doing stuff with us right now. And it's just when, whenever you find somebody who truly loves something and like, I like machine learning, I don't love it, but you find somebody who loves machine learning or algorithms or some specific type of trade. It doesn't matter what, I mean, a, a conversation with them is just exhilarating. It's, it's just fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm not nearly the interviewer you are, Aaron, but, um, I, I can, I, I love to hear anyone talk about anything that they love. And so for me, that's by far the number one, uh, source is I had, I had to develop a little bit of vocabulary and then I started talking to people who actually know what they're talking about. Right. I know some people are going to be listening to this and kind of curious as to what some of those books you read were. So, I mean, that was my motivation for asking, but maybe, uh, We'll link up after this and, um, you know, if you can think of what any of those titles were, then we'll just stick them in the show notes. But if we look at your current situation today, as I understand it, you are running a portfolio of around about 80 automated models. So your day-to-day -day is kind of trading these models, overseeing, managing these models. I guess one of the things I, I sort of want to get to is like what, are these types of strategies <laughs> just how yeah, would you what, categorize what the them yeah <laughs> not exactly the parameters but yeah <laughs> how would you categorize these strategies because you've come from a click trading background right so i i, I mm. feel like you probably think about strategies quite differently to how someone who might be uh just a pure quant who might be using yeah. Uh, or someone who might 
you know, if you think about like a, a systematic trend follower, like their strategies are very kind of, mm-hmm. I, I feel like the strategies you use on an intraday level uh, are quite different. And it, is that making sense? Like I'm, I'm just interested in sort of how you categorize the strategies which you run today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I run several, I think of them as families of strategies. Um so I, I run several different families of strategies, uh, and they're pretty much all going to be based on some anomaly um, that I or someone else has found, uh, and then we're, we're we're sort of working on trading it together, right? So you'll get, uh, let's see, what what would all the families be? There are some that are mean reversion, okay, and so those are going to be. I have no idea why or how they work. If I'm being honest with you, um, I mean, I, I like, I, like, I, like, I understand, I understand the concept of why they work. What I don't understand is why are they not already crowded out by like big market making firms and HFTs and stuff? Like, I don't, I, I don't get that, but somehow, somehow they do. So, so to me, they're relatively straightforward. It's like the things that you would expect in a, in various little mean reversion strategies. Can I just rephrase the question a little bit? Have you automated things that like good click traders would go after? You know, like like the things that you would trade by hand, are they the things which you've automated mm-hmm. or are these more things which, I don't know if this has just confused the matter or not, but. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Like there are guys, let's just yeah. very simple example, who will, Mm -hmm. short uh, stocks which go parabolic and you could categorize Mm -hmm. those as mean reversion types of strategies. But, you know, have you written algos to short parabolics, for example, or are your strategies a lot more niche than that? No, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I've I've written algos to short parabolics or to buy parabolics, you know, both ways. Yeah, so, I mean, I've got mean reversion families, I've got momentum families. I've got stuff that trades based on earnings or conference calls, right? I've got stuff that's, it's like, you know, that news is going to come out in something and you have some expectation of what's going to happen when that news comes out. And then the moment the news comes out, it actually does start to go up, you know, and you knew it was going to go up or down. <laughs> and so it just buys. Um, it's, it's read the news uh, it saw one of the keywords that it was supposed to. And so then, you know, it, it buys on this breakout of whatever sort that it was. There are, what else? I mean, there, there's, there's a bunch of weird anomalies. Like there are things that are like at this time of year, uh, for whatever reason, investment banks all put out a bunch of ratings. And so weird stuff happens because of ratings. Or at this time of year, you know, all the big, the CFOs decide that they're going to put money into looking into acquisition targets. And so people start to get really excited about potential acquisition targets um, and there starts to be some momentum in them. And so we're going to trade on that anomaly or whatever it is like that. Just before we move off the subject of automation, and we'll, we'll wrap this up shortly, I've just there's just a couple other things I'd be curious to ask you about. Mm-hmm. You know, for someone who's currently uh, a click trader, a discretionary trader, and they're doing well, they're making money, they they've reached a point of consistent profitability, and they see that they they're attracted to the idea of implementing some sort of automation how would you encourage them to take the first steps towards that? Like where would be a good starting point? Okay. So I think really what you want to do is you want to find someone who has a good platform that's already built out for you. Um, if I'm being just giving you the advice that I think is the best, it may not be the easiest because it, it may be expensive to get access to somebody's stuff. But I mean, I, I can tell you absolutely from personal experience, if you can, if, if I had had a full suite of tools 12 years ago, uh, when I first started building stuff, I would have been really blowing and going within 
18 months max. And I mean, my, my P and L would have gone parabolic. It, it would have just been amazing. And so instead, um, I built up all these different things kind of slowly over time. Um, and they, uh, as a result, I had these kind of parabolas that were punctuated by giant crashes, right. As, as I would make some, some giant mistake. Uh, and so, so at this point we have, we have kind of the full, the full suite. Uh, and so that, so that feels a lot better. Uh, but I, I would strongly recommend if you can, uh, to find somebody who's, who's got it fully built together. And so, so, you know, may, maybe there's some third party out there. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, a second option is to partner with someone, um, who knows what they're doing. I mean, I do, this is probably not that helpful to most of y'all, but the, uh, like every, every summer I bring in a bunch of interns, Right. And so I, I bring in a bunch of interns and the idea is y'all get exposure to this world. Y'all get to see what I do, um, what we do, how, how we do it, how we make money. Uh, and then maybe a few of you will really click here. And then whoever does, I mean, we're, we're going to get, it's like all of this stuff is already built up, right? So, so one of you who's already a really successful hand trader may just be saying, yeah, John, an, an internship isn't what I want. And that's, that's great. But maybe you can find someone else who's already built the stuff up who could similarly partner with you, right? It may not be as an intern. It may be as a true partner. But yeah, I, I would strongly recommend it. It's such a complex system. There are so many things that multiply rather than add uh, that you should really, uh, you should really try to get something that has the full ecosystem where it's a third party uh, or it's a partner. Okay. Just a couple quotes of yours, which I'd like to pick up on. Uh, and this is just from the, the few things you sent me prior. Uh, one line, which I picked out, which I thought was really interesting. Actually, you might've said a little earlier too. I should obsess over what my edge is. So I guess the question I'd like to bounce off that is, how should a trader think about and how can a trader truly maximize and optimize their edge to the extreme? Because I think this is something which you have done really well. That's a good question, man. And I, I wish I had even, I, I wish I had much better answers than I do. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell you that that really helped uh, turn my trading career around. I, I remember I kept hearing this voice in the back of my head that there was this guy that there were these two guys who were talking. Um, and one of the guys was like, Oh yeah, I'm putting, I'm putting on this trade. I'm going to do this. And so this other guy is like, why? And the other guy tries to explain it to him. And he says, well, why would you do that? What's your edge? He said, what's your edge? And so I'm always, I'm always defining my edge whenever, wherever, however I can. And then the idea is you just want to make the absolute best that you can off of that. Um, so the way that I would say that your edge evolves. Okay. So first of all, like I said, I've, it, everything that I do, it's just, I noticed that it worked and I couldn't necessarily articulate the whys of why or how it works. Um, but I definitely understood this happens. This distorts the market in the following way. And so you can either kind of get in before it has distorted the market. You can kind of predict that it's about to distort the market, or you can get in on the back end once it's kind of blown up the market. Um, and you can, you can get in there to pick up the pieces, right? So I see this pattern that'll happen and I'm going to follow it. Uh, I mean, to, to give an obvious example and here's, okay, I'm actually going to give a strategy to y'all. This is just the easiest. I've done this like four different times. Whenever Bitcoin finally makes a move, then Ethereum makes a move after it, then kind of the third tier coins make a move, and then the altcoins make a move after it. So if you look in the past, whatever it is, three months, um, I was sitting in Bitcoin. Bitcoin makes it its move. It goes from 10 to, I think it went up to 30 something. And then it was very easy. You could just go buy Ethereum. 
So you can buy Ethereum. I think it was in like 300 bucks at the time. And then you buy your Ether at 300 bucks. And then the thing goes up to 1500, 2000, that kind of thing, right? Well, sure enough, after Ether makes its four, five, six X move, then all of the sort of next tier coins start doing this crazy stuff. Um, I mean, the most obvious one being Dogecoin, but I think that had its own catalyst. I mean, the point of telling you this thing about the crypto, like, that's just, obviously, this is not investment advice. This is just a pattern that I've noticed. And if you go look in the past, you can see that the pattern has definitely happened and you could have definitely made money on it, right? And so, so I don't have to fully understand that. I can understand it in kind of increasing depth, but I can keep making money on it. Okay, so so with the edge, here's here's a thing. Um, it was a thing. Th- this this is a thing that that I thought of. I, I think that's a lot. Um, a lot of people say, "Well, I couldn't be a trader. I couldn't be an entrepreneur. I couldn't be whatever because that's just I, I don't think that big. Um, it, it's just it's too big. That's too much. That's too whatever. Um, I, I I think that it's the exact opposite. I think that actually. The reason that very few people make it as a trader or as an entrepreneur, as whatever, is that they don't think small enough. So in this case, you have to be willing to say, my edge is this tiny, stupid thing. In my case, it was this one tiny little um, anomaly that I picked up and barely fully understood and only lasted a few months, 13 years ago. And I had this one little edge and it worked well. And so what did I do? Instead of saying, well, I have to be, I have to be better than that. I can't just, I have to be better than the market. I have to be better than stocks. I have to be whatever. No, I just took this one tiny edge that I had and it worked from there. Um, and so what, what you want to do with your edge is you keep, you just keep growing it 1% every day if you can. Um, I know so many people that it's like, oh, how'd, how'd you do last year? I made 70 grand. Well, what if you just put something automatic in there that increased your size by 1% every day? Okay, and then they do that. How did next year go? Wow, I made 300 grand. How did next year go? Wow, I made a million bucks. You know, um, and it, it, it can happen so fast. And so with, with your edge, I mean, I, I think the thing is you're constantly, as long as you're constantly trading it, you're seeing all these different elements and cases and specifics, and that helps you start to sort of triangulate what exactly is it that's really making this thing tick? Is it like this trade goes in cycles? You know, I mean, like the the the, the hot stuff. The hot stuff lately has been these meme stonks and the spacs, right? So those have been those have been just so hot. And those things have been completely cyclical, right? So the the meme stonks, it's like it's like they go in they go in these little waves where they're sort of only work on the momentum side for a little while, and then they kind of churn for a little while, and then they only work on the mean reserve reversion side for a while. So you know may, maybe what you figure out is yeah, I, I need to figure out what part of the cycle I'm at. Um, so now you've expanded your edge. You had one edge which was maybe you knew the momentum side of it. But then now you figure out, oh, okay, I need to know where I am in the cycle. And then I need to be aggressive or conservative based on that. So then that's this kind of next layer that you've added to your edge. And so if you can add those little layers, 1% a day, you know, 20% a month, whatever it is, um, and you keep adding them, they compound very quickly. And so your edge goes from being this, this tiny thing that everyone would make fun of because you just found this, this tiny thing that barely even matters in the market to all of a sudden you can make a significant amount of money on it. I don't know if that's helpful. Is that helpful, Aaron? I think it is helpful. I mean, that's exactly how you became profitable in the first place. And I mean, who knows where you'd be today if you hadn't have kind of discovered something like that. Because it sounds like you were almost, you know, in those that first year, you were almost at a point where you'd run out of money and we're going to go look at other options. But you'd found this little edge, which you were able to continually, um, you know, build upon and increase your size and enabled you to really grow your account and to, you know, start building out into other edges and maximizing those. Gosh, yeah. I mean, when when you put it that way, I'm just. I'm I'm so incredibly grateful for everything that's kind of come together at different points. Grateful for all the people that I met. I'm I'm ashamed that I made as little 
of it as I as I could have. But I'm I'm just I'm so excited, man. It's like I wake up in the morning, like I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning, uh, just hyped. I'm just <laughs> trading trading stocks is the best, most wonderful thing. I can't believe I'm so privilege that i get to do it i i just i love it aaron <laughs> i feel you honest. i feel you yeah some <laughs> some days you've got to be um yeah you feel very fortunate to be able to do what you do so on that note john let's uh let's call this a wrap uh if someone is interested in kind of connecting with you somehow or find you online i know you don't have a great online presence but i think you are on twitter i don't know maybe linkedin do you want to share anything uh like that yeah, sure. So, I mean, technically I have a Twitter, but it's, it's mostly for myself. Um, I, I think the main place, I think I'm on LinkedIn, uh, somewhere. They sent me enough emails that was like, your friend wants you to, to join. But I, I, I have a, I have an account on Quora, uh, that I used to post on a decent bit. Yeah. You, you could reach out to me there. You could find me on LinkedIn, um, and send me a message. So I'll put links to all those three in the show notes and uh, those show notes will be at chatwithtraders.com slash 213, episode 213. Uh, John, uh, needless to say, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing what you have. Uh, it's been really nice to speak with you. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. Thanks for what you do. And man, go out in the markets and crush them. <laughs> all right, we'll talk soon. Thank you. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.